Is that true of the younger set as well? It's not true with as, as true with the younger set. I think uh, the younger set is less politically inclined, um, have less memory of, uh, uh, you know, of the, uh, uh, the North being oppressive. So they, they tend to be more open. And the fact that the truth of the matter is Saigon is dictated by money. Um, so even if they uh, may not personally like someone from the North, that person tend to have more power than them in the political fields. So they wine and dine them if they need to do a business with them. Um, you cannot get your business done, especially a big one, without going to Hanoi and um, you know, plead the case to central power. So that's sort of the divide then. The North is still, um, is still sitting with the stranglehold on the political power and the South seems to be the economic nerve center. Yeah. And in a way, it's, um, it's an interesting power play mm -hmm. because the South uh, understands that the North is always going to need it. Um, and it has the know-how. It has the international connections. The Vietnamese who fled in 1975 and subsequent waves uh, largely went to the West and invested now in Vietnam. So the people who belong to so-called uh, the losing side uh, are connected internationally. Um, uh, you know, uncle will send money home and the son will start a little shop. If he's good, it might turn into a chain. Um, he may not have the political power, but with money he can buy it um, for his own, uh, you know, uh, support. And uh, I see that happens all the time. Uh, so in a, in a way, you know, the Viet Q actually play a very central role in that, especially uh, when Vietnam was very impoverished. You know, um, there's been estimating which, you know, Vietnamese overseas sends back money that was at one point considered about 16% of the GNP. Do you have any um, quantifiable measures of how much of a role the Viet Q from America play? I mean, how much is this engine yeah. driven by Vietnamese American investment? Um, I sat at a dinner party the other night between a venture capitalist who was uh, an engineer here and be another woman who was uh, a vice president of a, a very big American company. And uh, they were just talking and uh, the venture capitalist who's from San Jose um, basically said, I have 35 million that I need to invest soon. And this woman basically said, oh, well, talk to my husband, you know. He's gone up north to build some buildings and let's talk about it. Um, there is a sense in which uh, Vietnamese Americans are playing some very important roles in investment now on a larger scale. That has to do with the fact that uh, companies that are going to Vietnam are hiring Vietnamese uh, Americans who have MBAs because they can negotiate much better than uh, non-Vietnamese in Vietnam. Um, so you will see Vietnamese American playing uh, executive roles. Vietnamese Americans who are director of um, director of, uh, you know, NGO, um, you know, that does work in uh, the fields. You see a Vietnamese American who are now becoming American journalists. You know, the AP Bureau chief in Hanoi for a long time was a friend of mine. She's Vietnamese American. We, you know, uh, it, it seems like a long time ago, but we were in some pretty impoverished parts of yeah. Vietnam uh, when we began this trip. And it seems that um, while the government has done a fairly decent job of eradicating a lot of dire poverty, it still persists. And you'd worried about the growing gap between what the people at that village level witness every day in their hardships and what we're seeing in the cities. Uh, reflect on that a bit, I mean, is, and where do you see that going? Yeah. Well, I think the cities are growing bigger. Um, they all become what you understand as mega cities. When I left Vietnam, Saigon was a very small city of maybe one million, and now there's more than 10 million people living in Saigon and vicinity. And um, there are people who would just leave their little thatch roof hut in that dire poverty in the far south um, to go up and just work as menial laborers because even that, they would make more money than farming because the, a lot of farmers always owe money until the crops come in, and if the crops don't come in, they are in debt. It's almost like a normal life for farmers, and it's punishing. That say, I think um, it's not that poverty is getting worse. 
is that the rich-poor gap is getting far, far wide, widened because uh, the rich have become super rich. I mean, super rich in the imagination of the West. You know, there are now Vietnamese who can buy Rolls Royces, Ferraris, you know, and they pay triple the taxes in order to, uh, to buy one. Um, all the luxury goods are very expensive, and yet they are, you know, wearing the latest uh, Versace or Hermes um, bag, whatever. And, you know, um, and that's so obvious to people, you know, they're, on, they're celebrating their wealth in such a way that is, um, you know, that reminds me of um, something along the robber barons of the American 1920s. Um, and you know what happened after that uh, in America as well. Um, so there is this sense of injustice, even though poverty ha has actually been, uh, you know, dealt with in, by and large in, in some successful ways. Um, and uh, one of the deepest crises I see now is that everyone wants to have that kind of wealth. They love Bill Gates, for instance, and they want to have money. The money is becoming the only contractual agreement the government can provide to its people as an ideology. You open a newspaper, uh, you turn on a TV, it's all about investment from overseas and which company has grown and how many people have gained jobs and so on. Um, in essence, uh, the media here is, by and large, a business page. And that has been pounded in um, to the consciousness of the Vietnamese, you know, uh, along the line of Deng Xiaoping up north who say to make money is glorious. And they are very much driven by the material wealth. And because they are driven by the material wealth, they are terribly unhappy. Um, even those who didn't have uh, much to begin with and was okay two generations back are now willing to sell themselves or sell their, their children in, you know, uh, to um, work in some places that's high risk so that they have some kind of money. Um, there are people who take in enormous risk going to Taiwan and uh, ended up in brothels because they thought they're gonna marry someone and have a better life. Um, they take enormous risks and sometimes it creates um, a kind of social unrest because uh, wealth becomes the all uh, meaning of uh, you know, Vietnamese direction. And I think for any country that uh, loses its uh, moral compass. What other option does the government have? Because everything you're seeing on the street from the Bentleys and the big buildings and the fashion shops is fighting the ideology. Mm -hmm. It's a post-ideological world and the government is trying to hold to its power by basically promise all this wealth as a way to appease to the oncoming unrest. But like I say, I think that for a country if that is ruled by materialism, it inevitably loses its moral compass. And Vietnam has always been a spiritual country. This is how they fought uh, against the French, the Chinese. It's a kind of sacrifice um, for the greater good. And that has completely disappeared. Um, what is now is this crazy individualism that's kind of riding over um, the old values. The old values are not disappearing completely, but there is a kind of uh, social pressure, even if you're not a materialistic person, to have to have the same things that everybody else has. Um, but it's not a direction that can give them ultimate sense of well-being. And for a nation to lose its, to lose its uh, moral compass, it's very easy for foreign uh, organizations and power to come in and take advantage of that kind of uh, you know, inferiority complex, if you will. Um, and I think every nation needs a national project, a national idea of itself that is beyond the self, if it's going to be uh, viable.